So this is going to be incredibly difficult to get in a singular take, but I will have to make do with whatever I do first. To start off, this is going to be pretty difficult to do off the cuff. Uh, it's not necessarily going to roll off the tongue in a manner that necessarily fits the context of this situation, but I'll have to try. So I am sticking to the topic of the Royal Navy for the moment, technically, but this is going to sort of cover the wider issue of, I guess you'd say, expensive unit defence. So that being that the military tends to, in the modern age, uh, for most countries, but the UK as well, spend significantly more on particular, particular units when they are purchasing from firms. And sort of why that may be not necessarily such a bad thing. I'll just start talking. So this video sort of begins with a conversation I had with a friend. This very good friend, who shall remain nameless, was discussing politics with me. And somehow we were discussing sort of parliamentary procedure. Uh, he began talking about the Type 26 frigate. And what he said, I think, makes for a good topic of discussion. And I'd like to hear other people's sort of thoughts on this because for the minute I do have my own opinion. So in this video I'm going to discuss Type 23, Type 26, Type 31 and Type 32 frigates, uh, but also maybe a little bit of the Type 45 destroyer just for comparison. Uh, but more than that I'm going to talk about the firms involved in the defence industry for the UK. And I guess this is applicable towards the wider world. Uh, and every cost I mention is probably going to be the uh, Royal Navy's variant. So if I say how much a frigate is, it's going to be the cost to the Royal Navy specifically. So if we are to look at the Type 23, the Type 23 is an older frigate variant. As you may know from my prior video, the Type 31 is the frigate that will replace it. So what you may not perhaps know is that there are also two other frigates that may replace it, one sooner and one after. So this is all a bid by the UK to expand the surface fleet, to increase British maritime power, uh, and to create a force that's more adaptable to the UK's needs. So the other uh, frigates incoming are the Type 26, of which I think three uh, three ships have already been built, or are in the process of being built, and the Type 32, which will come in around 2030. So these are the three frigate types for the next decade, probably. So these ones are replacing the Type 23 at various points in time, uh, and the primary role of any frigate is, I guess, first and foremost, surface escort. So it plays a, an essential role in any strike group or escort group or any group, really. But it also has, you know, for these super frigates, land attack capabilities, anti-air capabilities. It's a very good all-round ship, whatever, you know, its specific role is, even if that is highly specialised. And also you have uh, frigates for the purposes of stuff like uh, pirate hunting, if that is even a thing, I guess, or trying to tackle drug smuggling. <clears throat> Whatever it may be, it's beyond military usage as well. So it's got to be versatile and capable. Anyway, to get back to this conversation with my friend, uh, we were discussing how expensive the Type 26 was, and he was saying that this was an outrage, a travesty. Uh, and I said, I don't agree that it's a travesty, but it is certainly rather expensive. It costs even more than the Type 45 destroyer, and he was shocked by this, uh, and he began to discuss how the government was lobbied on this sort of matter, that the entire defence sector uh, and the government is all corrupt, that firms overcharge, that these expensive units are a waste of money for the taxpayer. And this is a view, I think, not myself, but a lot of people hold. I find this view mirrored in a lot of communities that I sort of observe, or videos that I may watch. And, as I say, I've looked online after this conversation, and I have seen that this sentiment has been largely 
I guess, supported in some communities. This view that firms overcharge on uh, units, that large defence firms have a firm hold on the government via lobbying, and that lobbying is rampant within the industry, and this is all a large problem. I just thought that this specific frigate example, uh, within Type 26, or the replacement for Type 23, is a good way to sort of demonstrate my point in regard to unit expense. So, it is true that a Type 26 costs more than a Type 45 destroyer. A Type 45 costs just over a billion pounds, or costed over a, just over a billion pounds, I think, uh, 1 billion, 50 million. And a Type 26 frigate costs more than that, at 1.23 billion pounds. And that's not the full picture, I don't think. So beyond inflation, if we are to consider a few things, primarily, Type 26 is significantly more advanced. It's a super frigate. Type 45 was built from 2003 to 2010, meant to be this general purpose, you know, workhorse, destroyer. Uh, sorry, I said Type 45 frigate, I meant the Type 45 destroyer. The Type 26 frigate was announced in 2017 as the new super frigate. Technologies are going to be vastly different and have different levels of expense. It is meant to be a higher-end ship. It's meant to be, you know, incredibly specialised, but also versatile. It is meant to be incredibly potent uh, in a way that perhaps a more run-of-the-mill general-purpose ship wouldn't be, like Arrowhead 140, that being the Type 31. Secondarily, there is this key missing component within this argument of it's too expensive, which is the ignoring of the idea of specialization. So a Type 26 has a very specialist design. It's incredibly apt at hunting submarines, or at least I think it's called literally the hunter class. Uh, it is designed to hunt submarines. That's a specialization. It can hold its own in other circumstances, but it does have a very specific purpose, and that's going to take very specific technologies, as well as these sort of modular uh, integration campaigns for the military in general, which, you know, largely useful, but it does cost money. But also, Type 26 has incredible missile capabilities. It's got land strike capabilities. It is really a super frigate. That is what it is. So if we look at the specific armaments that it has. So for HMS Glasgow, which was, I believe, the first uh, Type 26 produced, it has 48 VLS cells for Sea Scepter, which is anti-air, 24 Mark 41, which we covered, Tomahawk cells, uh, or ASROC anti-ship missiles. It's got one 5-inch 62 calibre Mark 45 naval gun, two 30mm guns, two phalanx, two miniguns, four general purpose machine guns, as well as, you know, the Wildcat, the helicopter, or the Merlin, which is specifically designed for submarine hunting. So you either have four anti-ship missiles or two anti-submarine torpedoes, uh, as well as general aviation facilities, which can accommodate two helicopters, but also a large Chinook-capable flight deck, an enclosed hangar, facilities for UAVs, and these, this flexible mission bay. If we're just looking at armaments themselves, I mean, it is comparable to the uh, Type 45 destroyer. So, Type 45 destroyer, in regard to armaments, it has uh, 48 VLS cells for either generally Aster, but uh, PAA, MS anti-air. It's got 4 times 8 harpoon missiles for anti-ship defence. It's got 4.5-inch Mark 8 naval gun, two 30mm guns, two 20mm phalanx, two miniguns, and six general-purpose machine guns, as well as a wildcat with either four Sea Venom anti-ship missiles or two anti-submarine torpedoes. Or I guess you could implement maybe a uh, Marlet air surface missiles, or maybe depth charges, and then the Merlin, which can incorporate four Stingray torpedoes. It's got a Chinook-capable 
flight deck, but it doesn't necessarily have all of the other capabilities. So there is additional expense, and that's not even considering modularity. So there is this specialization to consider. Anyway, I talked about this with my good friend, and we sort of got to the crux of his issue with this high unit expenditure, which was that while this is all very good, it seems to be very capable, it's a super frigate, um, he said that there were major dangers of these industrial bastions, like BAE Systems, these people, these firms even, that lead the industry for defence. He said that they were gaining a monopoly for defence in the UK, and this is, you know, a very negative thing. I think his exact words were that they had a stranglehold for everything. And I think that's really what I want to focus on, is that primarily, that's, I'd say, incorrect. Uh, no large defence project, like a ship, is built alone. So, at the beginning of my first video on the Type 31 frigate, I said, it's going to be impossible to, you know, give this system credit. You'd have to talk for, you know, a day at a time in order to even briefly explain its full capability. Uh, because it's just, it's an amalgamation, a synergy of so many different technologies, of so many different weapons systems. Even if it's not a super frigate, it is a super weapons system. These are very complex, complex systems. Uh, and no large complex defence project is built alone. There is no exception to that, ever. Um, there is never just one firm involved, you know, unless you're, I mean, generally not even in uh, Soviet Russia do you find stuff like that. So whether it's logistics, different products to be implemented, different parts used for these very complex weapons systems, even the parts supplied by the firms themselves, it's not all by the same firm. So firms like BAE Systems, these bastions of industry, they get berated for this power that they have, but the fact of the matter is that primarily they are the largest defence firm in the UK. There will be a front runner. That's a fact. And one could argue, uh, I don't necessarily have any insight on this, but one could say that this is a result of good business practices, innovation, ability to meet government demand. Moreover, BAE isn't just a production line. They innovate, they coordinate innovation, they coordinate other products. You know, they buy in other products from many different businesses, from many different uh, multinational, international firms in order to create something that delivers real value. So I was considering my friend's position and I thought to myself, you know, perhaps he has a point. It's all very well saying these weapon systems are complex and that, you know, perhaps... We can't know whether overcharging is occurring. We can't know whether these unit costs are too expensive. And I thought, well, perhaps he's right. The Type 31 frigate costs significantly less than the Type 26. But that is only to a degree. Uh, and apologies, my voice is getting a little bit raspy. Uh, this is at least by the technological constraints of any age so far. Modularity, i.e. the Type 31, what it focuses very heavily on, uh, can be at odds with singular specialization. And as I said in the video about Type 31 as well, Type 31 is designed to be a significantly lower end frigate. It's not meant to be this uh, super weapon. Although it is a super weapon, but it's not meant to be at the higher end of super weapons. As brilliant as its modularity is, it's designed to be simple, changeable, general use, efficient, uh, and, you know, really meet the lower end general use needs of the UK, of the Royal Navy. Um, so, you know, it really does depend on how that program actually plays out. We can't know whether that's actually realistic yet. We can't know that the expense is realistic or that Type 32 would be realistic. It focuses heavily on modularity. That can come with extra cost uh, in upkeep. 
And there are plenty of other considerations, but one can truly discourage such a black and white view of business in general. As in business, and government, and the military, decision making is a balance between many factors, but most notably cost efficiency and value prov provided, as it is with you know everything. So the argument that we should simply buy as many cheap ships or cheap weapons or cheap weapon systems as possible in order to bolster military branches uh, or military power isn't necessarily something that holds water. It's about meeting specific demand, specific demand of the time and cost efficiency in comparison to the potency it provides. Uh, I mean, if we wanted to really go well out on this argument, I get that this, this is taking it sort of ad absurdum, but we could just buy the Royal Navy some Viking longships from Denmark with SA-80s in hand to defend our nation, but we'd have a far greater fleet in that scenario, yet it wouldn't be as potent. It wouldn't meet the Royal Navy's, capa uh, not capabilities, requirements, uh, designed purpose. The point of this video isn't really to come down on either side to say it's overcharging or not, to say they're excessively expensive or not, rather just to say that it's not as simple as it is too expensive. Largely, unless you're involved in these decision-making processes, you can't know, uh, and you can't really necessarily predict as someone who doesn't have all of the information, including myself, where warfare is going to go in the future, what's going to be needed necessarily, and what is sensible to pay on these sort of things. Uh, or what, which firms to use, necessarily, in order to purchase such units. So, it is difficult, but expense isn't something one can evaluate with, without all of the information. Uh, we don't know, or, you know, often people don't consider what, it, what this expense will deliver to us, how many units will be bought. Uh, and that is something that's really pretty important, I think, before passing any final judgment on this sort of stuff. So, you know, it's also often not considered the other units bought alongside it. You make a large investment in a, I guess you'd say, a singular weapon system. But auxiliary weapon systems or accompanying weapon systems cost significantly less. You have to look at the larger picture. Is my point really a naval group a navy a military it isn't a singular unit some things are more expensive but what matters is the overall expense in comparison to the potency it provides in regard to the the synergy within units uh between units and within weapon systems themselves so it sort of to go back to the top 26 as we know it has other accompanying ship classes incoming ship classes. The Type 31 is designed to be its lower-end counterpart that's meant to save the money so that the Royal Navy can implement these rather expensive, true, but these super frigates. Uh, and those ships will have a synergy. They will, in groups, have a synergy. Uh, and, you know, in theory, or on paper, they do have a cheaper equivalent that serves a less high-end specialised function. So I guess the point of this video is really to say that uh, the question is not merely a matter of expense. The question is, are the processes in place within government, within the military, uh, within firms themselves, in order to determine the expense to defence ratio, so how much it costs versus the value, firepower uh, it will provide to the nation, the protection it will provide to the nation, and the utility it will have for the nation, are those processes ample? Uh, in any case, it might not be as simple as too expensive. And realistically, you know, the direction of any fighting force uh, does come with some extra costs for innovation, as it always has done. So we shall see what happens, but, uh, you know, one can't know the full details for sure. All I'd say is vilifying large firms, industrial bastions like BAE, it's no way to go about determining whether a decision is correct or not, and it's rather reductionist, really. Uh, 
the Royal Navy chooses to get supply from these places because there is a deep and rich history of getting supply from these places because their business practices are largely rather good because they have uh, perhaps an inherent trustworthiness, one could say. Uh, so I think that's really it. And this is just a bit of a bit of a counterpoint to the reductionist view of thinking either firms are villains in this scenario or units are too expensive.